Okay, so what we see here is the famous de Montfort incinerator. Now, it is uh, consisting of several parts, and I would propose to come and have a look at this side here, because then here we can actually see a cut open part of it to see the different layers of the brickwork. Now the real core of the De Montfort incinerator is obviously what we call refractory or heat resistant bricks. And you can see that they are built up in several layers here. Now refractory bricks, there are several models obviously. The ones that we are using mostly are the ones with a very high aluminum um, oxide content. And the reason for that is that they are very, uh, they are heat resistant on the one side, but they are on the other hand, they can also uh, deal very easily with temperature variations. And this is a batch incinerator, meaning that it's going to be heated up from ambient temperature up to eight, nine hundred thousand degrees in very short time. And then after a couple of cycles, it will go down back to its ambient temperature uh, once all the waste has been burned. Heat resistant bricks, first of all, well, yeah, they do resist heat. Um, they also have an accumulating effect for the heat itself, meaning actually they are on the one hand very good insulators. So if this incinerator is burning, I can actually put my hand on it. I will feel that it's hot, but my hand will not be immediately burned. Now, how can you recognize a good brick? Well, actually it is not so easy. Um, the bricks that we are having, it's mainly aluminum oxide, so Al2O3 with a composition of about 60% of that material. You would like to have as low uh, iron concentration as possible, okay? but always ask your supplier what is the composition itself. The bricks are very dense and they are heavy. Every brick here is about 4.5 kilogram a piece. I said it's dense, meaning that it's also very hard. So here you see that we actually tried to cut one of the bricks with a diamond disc. Unfortunately, there was not a liquid cooling. So you could see how deep we actually got into the brick and by then actually the diamond disc was already burnt and we had to stop. So this is of course a very difficult situation for the field because even if you would have already a diamond disc, it's still the liquid cooling which is a very big problem. So how can you solve it on the, on the field? Well, actually it's quite simple. As you can see that the, the width of a brick is about half of the length of a brick. So that means what we do is we just take a, a brick and we cut a V-shape on the top as well on the sides and at the bottom and then just by putting it flat on the ground with a chisel and a hammer, one good blow in that V-shaped cutout that we have made will actually break it and it will actually have this rough shape as we can actually see here. Now the most fragile part of all refractory material is always the joints. So the wider it would be, the more exposed it's going to be to heat and therefore the more risk there's going to be for cracking. So we want to keep that joint as narrow as possible. So how did we actually solve this? Well, very simply, we just turned that brick with the rough side outwards and there is no refractory cement that has to come here. The other side is actually very smooth and as we said, the width is about half of the length of the brick so it actually fits out nicely as such. We said already something about the refractory cement. So again, this is heat resisting cement. Now, some people will try to make it themselves with normal cement and some additives. I would advise you not to do so for the simple reason that it's most of the time not really very heat resistant as such. There are very good blends that are already existing on the market and the only thing what you have to do is add clean and non-salty water. And just by mixing it, you will have actually a perfect refractory cement. Again, refractory cement containing mainly aluminum oxide, the Al2O3. Now, also the way that the refractory cement is actually posed on the brick is quite special. In a normal situation, like a normal brickwork, they put the brick already on the wall and then actually the cement, the mortar, is put straight on the existing wall. And then a new brick is posed on top of it. For refractory bricks, you cannot do it like that. Again, the joint should be as thin as possible. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to take the brick in your hand and the prepared refractory mortar, you will put it on the brick and smear it open as you would do with choco paste on a, let's say on a sandwich. And then the sides, you would actually take a bit of the refractory mortar off on the 45 degrees so that there is not a lot of mortar actually coming out once you pose the brick. Once the brick is put on the wall, 
with a little rubber or plastic hammer, it can be put in position to obtain the smallest, the narrowest joints possible. Another problem that you have with a refractory cement, it is actually not very well resisting against the environment and mainly then humidity. And as you can actually see here, is if I strike here with my finger over it, the refractory cement starts to come out. And that is actually showing us that it's very important to protect the refractory material from the elements like rain, wind and so on. Now how this is done on the field, the easiest way would actually be to build a normal brickwork with normal bricks around it, as any normal mason everywhere in the world would do. However, it's important to leave a distance in between the refractory bricks and the normal bricks. And this is actually because this refractory bricks, once it's in operation, will get a little bit wider, a little bit bigger due to the heat. And therefore, it could push this normal brick wall away. And that is the reason why we always will leave here a gap of, let's say, about 10 centimeters. Now, this gap could stay completely open because air is rather a good insulator. But if there would be some humidity coming in there, it could still actually damage the refractory part. So therefore, what we propose is to put in a layer of uh, what we call vermiculite concrete. Vermiculite is an insulator which is very, very soft. And actually, it is mixed with some cement, but if I, you push with your nail into it, you can still feel that it would give just a little bit. So it is hard, but your nail can go just a little bit inside. Meaning as well that if this gets a little bit bigger due to the heat, that it will be compacting this vermiculite concrete. And this is actually what you can see once it was heated up here, that you see this opening here. Well, this is actually the space that it has taken over for the dilatation of your refractory bricks. The external wall also has another purpose. It is actually completely psychological. Most of the people, when they see the De Montfort incinerator by itself, they consider it as too small. And therefore, they will refuse it. They will say, this is not good enough. And just by building the external wall around it, it gives the impression it is a lot bigger and therefore a lot more performant. Let me tell you one thing here, that actually the performance of a De Montfort is not in its size. It's actually in the speed that it will well, actually burn up, incinerate your waste. So every two, three minutes, it's very possible, if you have a good incineration ongoing, that you should put in a new batch. So it's not the size that is counting, it is actually the efficiency it's burning with. And as it is rather small, also the heat is very concentrated and therefore the material will decompose very, very fast and the gases will burn very fast up. So you have to stay next to a De Montfort when it's actually burning. An important detail here at the back is actually this hole, right? And a lot of people think that this hole would be there for air input. The De Montfort incinerator is a double combustion chamber incinerator. So it is actually the material burning at the front part in the primary combustion chamber and then the gas is burning a second time in the secondary combustion chamber. And people actually believe that air has to be sucked in through this hole for having a good combustion. Well, this is actually not for that, this peep hole. It's actually a peep hole to see if there would be good flames in the secondary combustion chamber. So what we see here is the top frame with the loading door and then the chimney spigot with its chimney going through the roof. So when we open the loading door now, we can actually very well see that this is a very small primary combustion chamber and then followed by another secondary combustion chamber here, but we cannot uh, see it as such because the chimney should be taken off. However, if we look inside, then you might see that there is actually a tunnel going from the primary to the secondary. So basically, in the primary combustion chamber, it's here where we're going to put in our medical waste. But before we do that, we always will preheat it with some paper, a little bit of small wooden parts, uh, and a little bit of kerosene that we can drop over it just to, well, yeah, to make it easier to get it flared off the fire. Now, Waste, when it is burning, it's actually decomposing into gases. And these gases will decompose once again in carbon and hydrogen. And it's actually the carbon and the hydrogen that will burn. But very often, waste will decompose faster than it actually can burn, meaning that you're going to have a lot of 
combustible gases, which haven't burned yet, will rise. Now, in a normal single combustion chamber burner, these unburned gases would just go out of the chimney and you lose it, with as a consequence that a lot of thermoresistant pathogens and a lot of unburned toxic gases will escape. In this particular one, if the way the loading door is closed, then actually the gases will be sucked down back the, downwards, where it will pick up more heat from the flames and it will also pick up oxygen. And then they will flare off a second time inside the secondary combustion chamber, meaning that there's going to be less thermothermal resistant pathogens coming out of the chimney and also less toxic fumes. Very important here as well is to avoid that these gases will escape and that they are really sucked into the secondary combustion chamber is this seal. And actually, as you can see, it's a very simple seal. It is just construction sand that we have put in here. So in the beginning, when you just start an incinerator, it might be that there are still a little bit of gases escaping here. But the moment the secondary combustion chamber and the chimney, they grow hotter, well then they will create a suction effect and all the unburned gases will be sucked down again and flared off in the secondary combustion chamber and nothing will get through to this sand seal. At the bottom here of the incinerator we see the ashtray. Now in older models you might still see that the ashtray is connected to the incinerator itself with hinges. Now these hinges were bolted into the refractory material and again due to the heat effect they expanded and therefore very often cracks were quickly shown within the refractory material. To solve this problem, what we do now is just weld the ash door directly to the ash tray. Now you see here this little device. It is on the one hand, first of all, the handle to pull the ash tray out. It is on the second time also the air inlet for the air to be in, to coming in for the combustion. And also it is designed in such a way, if accidentally there would be some glass objects, let's say a vial, that went into the soft waste and due to the heat it would explode, then all the glass particles that we be blown out are actually deflected towards the bottom to avoid injuries. Okay, so to get it started, we will load some paper and some small pieces of wood via the loading door and which will fall here on the grill. Now to ease the start we could also add maybe a little of kerosene. Now the lighting by itself of this uh, wood, paper and kerosene will be done via the, um, the ashtray itself and once this fire starts to burn well it's only then that we're going to close the ashtray as such. Now once this is starting to burn we're going to see at the back if some flames are to be seen now in the secondary combustion chamber via the peephole. Once that is the case, then actually it's very simple. Then we will take here the handle of the loading door, we will open it and then just a batch of new medical waste can be put in. And once we have put in one batch, immediately we're going to close the loading door again. Now very important is to understand is where we are really standing ourselves. We're always standing here at the corner of the incinerator. The reason for that is very simple. The moment we open here the loading door, it might be that a big flame actually shoots out up to this level. And if we would be standing too close to it, we would actually get burned. So to a certain extent, we use the loading door as our shield to protect us against the heat. Now, once you close it again, it could happen if you would close it too fast that a small flame would come out here. And that is the reason why we always stand at the corner so that it could not hurt us ourselves. Normally, once all the incineration is done and all the waste is being burned, then we just leave it cooling down by itself. And my suggestion would be not to wait until everything cooled down before we actually will empty the ashtray. I would just do it before we start a new cycle. So meaning, for instance, tomorrow morning. So to empty the ashtray, the first thing that we have to do is to open the ash pit. And then it is just a question of removing the ash pit, taking it and bringing it towards the ash pit, where it actually will be just be 
put inside and with the help of a little bit of a brush, we can brush all the ashes just into the ash pit. The opening of the ash pit is actually rather small. Well, there is actually a very good reason for that. If by accident you would drop the ashtray inside, you actually will see it can never fall in. Also very important is before you put the ashtray back that you go in with a brush with a long stick and that you remove all the ashes that will be accumulated at the back. If you would not do that, after some while there would be so much accumulation at the back that there would be a blockage of your secondary combustion chamber. So you remove it and the ashes can also go into the ash pit. Once that is done, the ashtray can be put back inside the incinerator. Again here, it is not necessary to push it completely in because we're going to start a new cycle now and therefore we're going to put some paper, some wood and a little bit of kerosene maybe via the loading door and it's going to be through the opening here again that we're going to light the lot to start a new cycle of incineration. What we see here is what we call the intermediate burner. So the concept by itself looks very much like a De Montfort incinerator with that difference that the core is not made of refractory bricks and cement, but it's actually completely made of thick plated steel. Otherwise, the principle is completely similar. So here we see again the loading door where potentially there will be the sand seal. When we take off the chimney spigot, then actually here we can see very clearly that there is a secondary combustion chamber with a tunnel in between the primary and the secondary one. This particular model is more conceived, let's say, for the post-emergency interventions, so where a De Montfort would be for long-term use, very stabilized situations, this could actually be used, be constructed in places just after the emergency phase.